Igor, I'm really excited that you joined us. This talk might be helpful to entrepreneurs and uh, thanks for participating and the floor is yours. First of all, I want to thank you and the Go Global for inviting me. It's my pleasure to share something about my career, what I learned so far for eight years here in Silicon Valley. And my name is Igor, so today I will talk about career in Silicon Valley. Overall, originally I'm from Russia, I'm from St. Petersburg. I worked in many companies around the world. I worked in South Korea and Sonsonitonics and many other big companies like Motorola, um, Google, uh, Facebook. I also worked in middle sized companies like Snapchat, Netflix, and a lot of st different startups. Um, so overall, I think there's something to share, especially for people who are interested in building their career. So actually knowing about some specific things in, about cultures in Silicon Valley companies. So today we will discuss uh, basically four main topics about startups, unicorns, what the difference between them, what is funk, actually Daniel already covered this. Uh, then the four companies where I actually had a pleasure working on um, then the third topic will be about different ideas, how to get there, like what are the best approaches that actually work for me and for my friends. And the last one, we will cover different types of career, for example, QA, engineering manager, PM, designers, and TPM. What the difference is, how to build their careers and all this stuff, because I worked most of my time as a software engineer. Uh, recent years, I switched into management, but I feel there are a lot of other things and every person can find career that fits uh, him or her well. So we'll start from first topic about startups and unicorns, like what the difference? Probably most of you know, but uh, just for people who don't know, the biggest difference is about evaluation. So unicorn is startup that is not, uh, that was not sold yet, that didn't go to IPO, but which, whose evaluation is already at least $1 billion. Uh, and why $1 billion? This is pretty, kind of specific number because uh, most of startups, like successful exit of startup is about $100 million. It's considered successful. Uh, most of startups don't go there. For example, we had startup with my friend at Qs.com. We had about 40,000 downloads. We applied to Y Combinator. Uh, they didn't uh, accept us, we gave up. So that was an example of startup that didn't do anything and didn't even fly to like good evaluation. Uh, but if someone reached $1 billion, it means that this startup and his, uh, his founders usually have some vision. For example, we can think about like Google, uh, when they started their uh, Yahoo wanted to buy them for $900 million. It was also a very specific number and they were not ready. They didn't want to sell uh, to Yahoo for $900 million, even though that time it was crazy. Like uh, that was sure giant, like there was no chance for Google to survive, but they had vision. And now Google is like $1 trillion plus company. So there is something special about startups that are not acquired yet and reach this uh, bar. And the uh, United States is still leading the number of unicorns uh, um, that, uh, that are there. Uh, China is following there. And can you guess like what is the city where the highest amount of unicorns, uh, largest number of unicorns is currently? Daniel, maybe you throw the question yeah. so that can... Yeah, speak. let's do a poll. I have prepared a poll for you. Which is the highest number of the uh, unicorns uh, we have? So, uh, guys, please uh, uh, guess uh, your city. We have uh, Moscow, Beijing, New York, San Francisco, Seattle, London, Austin, Boston, um, Shenzhen, Tokyo. So, uh, please answer your question. Uh, or, uh, Pick your answer. Yeah, again, Unicorn is a company that didn't go public, for example, like Uber is not Unicorn anymore, uh, but has a relation at least $1 billion. Yeah. So it's kind of future. It's future. The, the only one thing you didn't mention about uh, Unicorns that it became a $1 billion uh, company within three years. So it's like uh, another time frame, another criteria. Uh, why they considered uh, one uh, like unicorns. So there are some one billion dollar companies, traditional business, uh, but they are not considered unicorns. So uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, it's one of the things many startups don't know. And uh, I just wanted to add. All right, so um, uh, we have interesting uh, breakdown. <laughs> um, uh, one, uh, so 20% of people think it's Shenzhen. Uh, 20% of people think it's Moscow. <laughs> oh, 
and sixty uh, percent of people think it's San Francisco. Yeah, of course, people are right. Um, of course, San Francisco is leading. That's why we are talking about Silicon Valley companies. San Francisco is not just the city; it's the big city, San Francisco. It's actually not big; around one million. Um, people live there but it's also the whole bay area that's considered silicon valley like tons of cities maybe like about 40 other cities around it all founds uh, this silicon valley so yes still leading but beijing is close they're doing really really well so uh, that's where i actually had a pleasure to work i as i mentioned came in 2013 there and i still still see there are so many opportunities and it's not just fun there are many other companies and if we look into the map of um, unicorns like for example for last 10 years you can see a huge amount of unicorns who are created even last year so previous year 2019 47 unicorns were founded and some of them we already know like calm for example is very interesting like med med meditation uh, engine so the the story is that some Startups don't fly, but in Silicon Valley, even if you don't fly, you can just join some successful startup, learn, and then continue this circle, try out a new startup. Other startups are acquired on so like 100 million plus evaluation, which consider a success. And then some successful startups become unicorns and they grow, they have their own, own vision. And eventually most of them, uh, I think their ultimate goal is to become a public company. And we know what Uber, Airbnb, they had really successful IPOs la last year. So they are not unicorns anymore. So let me start the next chapter of my talk um, from probably one of the most unique companies in Silicon Valley from the terms of culture. And also like it's exercise of you, I don't know if you have access to chat or just like think by yourself, what first comes to your mind when you hear about Netflix culture? Like, what is it? I think like there are a lot of stories about, around Netflix culture, a lot of actually even like entrepreneurs study this because they're definitely unique. Um, I was just one year in America working in some startup when Netflix approached me, we had some discussions and I didn't know much about that company. It was 2014 and I started to ask my friend that all were very excited, but then I checked sites like Glassdoor and others and I found this actually description of their culture, atmosphere of fear. Probably it was not the thing that I was uh, wanted to kind of uh, try because I was new in America. I just had only like H1B visa and that's all I had. Um, so I started to talk uh, with the people inside Netflix during interview process, like why people consider this. And they actually came up with a better slogan. They matched um, what uh, the company is actually doing in terms of culture. They say, we are not the family, we are a professional football team. It means they try to hire the top talent on all the positions um, and try to make sure that these people are motivated. They try to, to do, deliver the best of themselves every, every day. And yeah, of course, if, if someone doesn't deliver well, if someone is upset, is not excited anymore, they explicitly say even during the interview process, if, you, if you're not excited about Netflix, uh, it's not our goal to make you excited. We don't provide stock, for example, as many other companies, they have stock with like four years wasting. No, they pay, pay all cash, they pay really well cash on part of other fine companies. But if you're not excited anymore, and you're a professional, that's okay to leave any day. They don't want to retain you if you don't want to work there. So it's all about being professional. You're surrounded by people who are really professional, who are excited about, about the company. And sometimes it's letting go, but honestly speaking, I was there like two years and about like three months. I was, I was feeling very safe there. It was a very nice environment. I was surrounded by people who are really strong, like one of the top in people, there was no bureaucracy. So for me, it worked really well. I felt pretty safe uh, as long as I was delivering well and I was doing this. Um, and another part of Netflix culture is freedom and responsibility. And you can feel it in many cases. For example, back in 2014, uh, I was able to uh, commit uh, the code in the production without even code review. So code reviews of my peers was optional. And yeah, like probably not any other company in Silicon Valley of such scale can afford kind of such kind of freedom for the engineers. So I was making basically decision whether uh, I invite uh, reviewers or not, or I can just ship code in production. But then responsibilities go side by side with this. Uh, you cannot give away too, too much freedom. And first part of this uh, comes in, 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 in their culture that they hire only senior engineers, really engineers, not necessarily engineers, designers, people who have a lot of industry standards and they can have a good judgment. 
So responsibility, as I mentioned, comes side, side by side. And if I, for example, uh, commit something in production, it, it causes some failures. Um, maybe first time they say, yeah, that's bad. Second time I will probably let, let go. So of course, um, they have a lot of expectations from people who use this kind of freedom. But for me, it works very well. And another part of Netflix culture is they explicitly say, we are not 7-Eleven, we are Southwest Airlines. So they focus on doing one thing, but doing this thing the best in the world. And in the, in the in case of Netflix, it's easy. They just focus on streaming TV shows and movies. No ads, there's only one customer, only users who pay like eight plus bucks a month. Uh, that's all only customer they have. They don't stream like sports, other life events. So they really have like laser focus on doing the best. And this also describes a lot of their business and uh, how they actually optimize around this. When you speaking, it's a very interesting culture. Right? I recommend everyone, I think Daniel will share slides after my, my talk to check their deck. It's now considered obsolete. So in their official website, they have official description of their culture, but still it has a lot of things that you never were expecting to company to be so open. They openly say uh, what they value, what they don't value, and they don't pretend that they are family for sure. But for me, it works pretty well. But then I switched to Google and the question is like, why? Why if everything was going well, I switched to Google? The main part of this was that they're not the family. So it's not that I was searching for another family. It was that I had a plan to grow into management. I became uh, really excited about leadership. I was reading psychological books. And Netflix is not the company who will just invest in the person with like Russian accent, probably not understanding very well American culture. Um, they definitely do promote people into managers. And I have got a good example. My ex-boss uh, from Netflix was promoted from engineers, but he, had, he was from Canada. He had really good accent, really good understanding of culture. He was an amazing guy. And of course, they promoted him without uh, taking any like risks. But with me, of course, I needed much more preparation and teaching. And probably Google is uh, another company so I thought a better fit for me because they do invest into people um, and their culture is like more like family. Probably many of you watched a movie about Google, which I think probably the longest commercial in the world is like two plus, I think, hours about Google. Uh, I feel it's just ads, of course, but anyway, a lot of from this is true. Um, and I would say like career path is one of the things that really attracted me in Google. They do want you to grow to the area and to the position where you want. It's probably not as fast as I expected that time, especially there was very big switch from Netflix where like zero bureaucracy, like super fast, super optimal to Google, which was already a very huge company. I think that was already 80,000 uh, employees at that, that time. Um, and uh, of course it was, uh, their pace was slower, but I like the idea that the, I will have a career. And another part of Google uh, is probably, everyone knows it's like engineering driven culture. So they have a lot of internal tools. They have um, all the code base of Google sits in one repository. It's called like Monorepa. It's popular these days among Silicon Valley companies, but it means that if you work, for example, I was working in a Google Play Store, um, in Android app for um, Google Play, and I had access to everything. So I can see how Google search is done and all this stuff. And first of all, it's a lot of uh, also empowerment of engineers. Like if you are interested, you can try whatever you are, you are interested in. It's a lot of trust and it also pr provides opportunity to create very powerful internal tools. For example, the library that uh, some search uh, engine team developed to uh, know more insights about like people's psychology could be used in Google Photos, for example. This fantastic uh, uh, opportunity to share uh, knowledge of the um, company inside, and also a lot of tools that make all these kind of huge re repositories stable. There's integration tests, you can't land the different Google without approvals of uh, owners and all this stuff. And it all is also required because scale. Uh, when I was there, I was in Google in 2016. Uh, there were 10, at least 10 projects that, that has at least 1 billion daily active users. Think about this number, like 1 billion daily active users. Uh, so 10 of such projects, you probably know a lot of them, like Google Photos, like of course Google Search, Google Ads, YouTube, many others. So scale is huge, probably the highest, and the largest in the world. Um, so it's also a very interesting opportunity to touch something that will be 
used immediately by crazy amount of people. Um, and code ownership, as I mentioned, that's also interesting. Like most of files in Google have their owners. So if you want to um, commit something, it's not like a Netflix, you just like do by yourself and you don't even need uh, approval. This is the opposite side of the spectrum. Uh, every file you touch in your um, div, basically, in your uh, changes to the code base, most of these files will have owners. So they will be pinged and you need to wait for explicit approvals from, from those owners. Plus, they have Java readability person who checks that you have good Java code, uh, C++ readability. So they all a set of people, but still, those people are often overloaded. So for me, it resulted in very long uh, timeline to actually commit the code. So it was average like one week I was waiting to commit in the code compared to Netflix, where it could be immediately if I decided that my code is good enough and just share. So it was a big change for me, honestly speaking. And another part of Google culture is public levels. I think in many Silicon Valley companies, they do this these days. So you know uh, what uh, level engineers are around you. And I don't know, for me, I didn't find it very useful because I found that people often check uh, engineer levels before they come to the meeting. And sometimes people, especially with higher uh, engineer levels, they start speaking from their entitlement kind of, right? Like, and it not always works well, especially if person received like very high level in backend and then transitions into mobile space. Yeah, this person could be great engineer in backend, but it doesn't mean that this person knows much about mobile space. So having public level in this case, for example, didn't work well. Uh, you can also hide the level in Google, but of course, usually like people who don't have high enough levels, they hide high levels, they proud of this. Um, and yeah, of course, bureaucracy, like compared to Netflix, this, is, this was completely different level of things I need to fill out, forms, design docs for everything. Um, and it's also because Google is not designed for senior only engineers, top of the world. Google is designed for basically the smartest people, but all different levels of career. Like many people join just from university, the smartest people from university join Google and they spend most of their life in Google. That's pretty common there. But the problem is this, sometimes they have mentality that the best in the world is what they do in Google. So when they complain about your code, they can say like, this is not the way you do in Google which is not always right because sometimes industry standards could be a little bit higher. Anyway, the positive side of bureaucracy is that you actually write down a career plan with your manager every six months, this manager reviews with you, you get rated and you have actually path to grow into like next level if you're passionate about, even though it's sometimes could be pretty long story, but it's there at least, it's under your control. And um, I think Facebook is actually good um, compromise between like uh, a little bit too slow for me Google and very uh, optimized Netflix. I think Netflix try, uh, Facebook tries to get the best from both worlds. Uh, for example, it doesn't have this uh, public level, it doesn't have code ownership, it's much faster code review process. And I would recommend the people who are interested to compare these two companies, very good article from actually director of engineering that worked in both Facebook and Google. I think he has very good aspects to compare this company. And then Snapchat, it's not, not fan, but many people actually think that it's very close to become fan. That was my next company after Google. And uh, it uh, has a lot of commonalities with other Silicon Valley, but I would say it's also uh, unique. First, I would say opportunities are higher. Like when I joined Snapchat, I think it was 2017, 18, something like this. Um, it was still a very young company. It was maybe like about a couple thousand engineers. So of course you can uh, drive larger projects, you can influence the change. So I knew engineers who joined Snapchat and then next week they actually scheduled uh, the meeting with CEO Evan Spiegel uh, and Bob, uh, the co-founder to decide what will be direction for their Android app, for example. And eventually it actually resulted that they rewrote the whole Android app. So of course you have um, much higher um, chances to actually approach very senior leadership to influence the company uh, but there are also price for this, right? This company is relatively new. It doesn't have stable culture. So there are some uncertainties. So, um, and what that, uh, another part of uh, that makes Snapchat unique is actually design focused company. Most of companies in Silicon Valley, especially Funk, they're engineering focused. Like, you know, well, we all know probably like Larry Page, Sergey Brin from Google. We know Mark from Facebook. They all wrote the initial versions of their systems. 
Um, and in Snapchat, Evan actually was designer. So it's a little bit different culture. If in Google, I go at the task and then I go approach design team and tell, oh, please make good design for me. And then they make design and they can say like, oh, maybe we should change something like this. In Snapchat, the dynamics is completely different. Uh, design team comes to my team and tells, uh, okay, here is design. It was approved by Evan, so please execute. So that's kind of um, uh, long story short. So Evan uh, has special meetings with design teams every, at least when I was there, it was like every week. So Evan by himself reviews the designs and it's very focused on like user experiences, user interfaces. And it means that um, it's a little bit hard sometimes to challenge this, but you can, you can bring things like a data scientist or something like this. Um, um, but speed of development is much faster than Google. It's pretty normal, I think, on par with Facebook. It, that's not much. It also, does, at least when I was there, was, there was not much about ownership. There is like informal people who want to be included in the code reviews, but still, it was um, much more fun for me to work. Um, as I mentioned, the impact is uh, probably higher. You can achieve. It's easier to drive. A company is young. You can empower a lot of people around you and move like larger projects. For me, the biggest problem in Snapchat was future. Like when I joined, I worked about one, one, one year plus. Within one year, a lot of people that I knew actually left or were, were fired. Uh, then the stock fell down 3x. Um, so it was a little bit like un uncertainty for me in terms of future. Um, so, but now it's actually raised up after I left Snapchat like 12x. So probably now it's a completely different company. Um, but Definitely, that was the thing the buyer was more open for Facebook. Um, and then um, third topic will be about uh, getting into those companies. Um, I myself don't feel that I am like genius or something. I had like C grade for computer science at school. Uh, I just realized that in Russia, there are not many opportunities where you can earn a decent amount of money and not paying like bribes and all this stuff. So that was the biggest motivation, just find a decent career. Um, and it was hard for me to actually land in any uh, good company in, in Silicon Valley. I started from a small startup. I, it's called Tango Me. They actually brought me to America through H1B. And then I was actually working hard. And what is the, the most important piece, uh, kind of the top of the iceberg for me was LinkedIn, actually. Most of companies approached me there. So I do recommend investing uh, quite some time there because that's your face from your professional kind of career. And then I found like these five components of success that worked well for me. First preparation, like it's very important to prepare and I definitely spent quite some time to prepare. And nice part about Silicon Valley companies, it's kind of predictable. There are good books I will mention later uh, that help you to prepare. It's uh, not, you, you will not be asked completely random questions in Silicon Valley companies. Persistence is very important. Like I failed, for example, Google three times. So it's, it's always okay to fail and then consider this not a failure, but more like lesson. Like it's very valuable lesson. Every time you fail your interview, it, you will have some things to think about, to reconsider and prepare better for even to the same company. Usually it's fine in Silicon Valley to apply to the same company every six months. Um, but it's also important to be adaptable. You should learn like what company you didn't like about you, what they expected because for example, Netflix, if you don't use Netflix, if you're not excited about Netflix, there is no way you will get jobs there. So uh, try to understand like what is special about the company, why you work, want to work there and all this stuff and understand what they value in their um, employees as well. And there's self-promotion, like uh, it starts from LinkedIn where um, some people brag too much, some people um, are, are too shy. I think there should be good balance there. Uh, promotion, like t telling about all the accomplishments you, you, you did and not necessarily in your professional life, it could be even your university, it could be like driving something. There are companies that's very mission driven, like Airbnb, for example, and they want you to have some volunteering efforts, like something that you did for humanity, not for money. So it's important to cover good things you did in the past. But it's also important to be humble. So there's very good balance between bragging too much and being too shy. You should find this balance because for example, if you say like, oh, I did this ambitious project and you tell about how great was the project and you didn't mention anyone around, there are questions like, how do you, what is the really ambitious if just one person actually delivered this? 
or are you just trying, I'm not team player, for example, right? So it's important to recognize people around you because all the big thing that we do is usually collaborations, not just one um, team player. And also there are professional, um, professional websites and companies that actually help you to land. For example, Careerist or Pathrise, you just approach those companies, they help you to fine tune everything like LinkedIn, they help you to uh, learn important skills, all the stuff. And sometimes they even don't charge you money until you land uh, your, on your first job where you get like percentage of your annual salary, which actually means you have the same initiatives at the company. You have uh, the same uh, ultimate goal to land on the job in got good company and really good uh, high salary there. And yeah, the most important part for me, uh, I felt uh, 40, 40 times, I think I, I applied 40 interviews, uh, 40 different companies across my eight years in Silicon Valley. I get about like maybe 10 or eight uh, offers. So I failed absolute majority of my interviews. Of course, over time, the, um, the success rate went up, but it's very important to never give up. This is actually a um, picture I had in my physics in my high school. I remember this one. It's very inspirational for me. Um, and then let's talk about phases of interview. So it usually starts with a re recruiter's call and every phase of interview is actually important step without which you will usually not uh, proceed to next one. So it's important to prepare for each step. This is usually a pretty informal call and the main goal of this piece of interview is to check like if your LinkedIn or your resume is actually represents you. If you really did these projects, if you really know insights, if, and if you're just like nice person to actually talk with. Um, but it's very important to make sure that you don't tell long stories. Like this person who um, does this call could be not very technical. So respect this person, don't go into like complex terms, just like answer the questions you are you were explicitly asked. And then hire a manager call, like not all companies do this. It's kind of optional, but if the company is serious about you, it's often that they want it to invest money in you and they show it when hiring manager calls you and tells you about the team, like how amazing it to be there. But still, even on this stage, this person will also check like, um, will, this, will he or she enjoy working with you or not? And then probably the most important part to before on-site is technical call, which usually like one hour and it depends on your, um, your, the job you wanna land, but usually it's related to your past experience where you need to do like coding or some practice. And the main question the company asks on this stage, I do have uh, maybe about 50% chance to get offer if you go to like on-site because on-site is a lot of investment. Before companies will fly you all over the world to the headquarters, give you good food. Now it's all remote, but still it doesn't matter. It's a lot of investment from company because it will be at least like five people who will spend like um, time with you. So they don't want to bring people that don't have high chance to get an offer. So on site, as I mentioned, the most important stage, uh, I will cover a few parts of this on site. It all depends of course on the uh, job, uh, but overall uh, it's pretty, uh, predictable what will be there. And your recruiter actually will, usually they do a very good job. They describe all you, um, all what expect. And uh, uh, companies like Microsoft and Google even send me like huge emails, how to prepare on every stage, like what books to read, what size to check. So uh, it's also about preparation. And then uh, when you get offer, there is also uh, optional step when you negotiate if you don't like this offer, which can also take quite some time. And this book I would recommend for everyone who is interested in Silicon Valley, it's the book about uh, cracking the coding interview, but overall it covers actually about architecture interview and even offer negotiation parts. I, I think it's kind of Bible of uh, engineers who wanna uh, work in Silicon Valley. I, every time I was uh, preparing for new rounds of uh, interviews, I was reading this book from begin to end. And I think I read like maybe eight times, solved all the tasks there eight times. It's like amazing book. And I would also want to mention that there is social part of interview and not all people recognize this one. Uh, basically, um, when we actually meet uh, with some person, we have very limited of, of amount of time uh, that we make decisions whether we like this person or not. So yeah, please also throw, uh, I'm just curious, like how, how much time you think average human needs to make uh, an unconscious decision um, that uh, this person is likable or not. Like how much time basically, how much buffer we have between we first meet the person 
and until this person thinks, oh, actually, I like this person, I don't like. So Daniel, uh, let, it, let me know if people start writing, like, I'm curious what will be the numbers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, say, uh, repeat your question again, and please, guys, uh, type your questions in the chat. Type in the chat. Okay, let me try. Oh, no, you, so, you, you just repeat your questions, uh, and uh, guys, ah, answer in the chat. Ah, okay, okay. I, I repeat. So, how much time usually people spend before meeting other person, and until they have uh, unconscious or subconscious decision that they like or don't like this person? So what's the buffer of likability between, oh, three seconds. Aidar is uh, very pessimistic. For three seconds, I would feel it's kind of hard to demonstrate much, but I, I'm sure that person who actually um, just do this within three seconds for sure. Two minutes is a little bit too positive. We don't have two minutes, unfortunately. Um, but thank you, Jana, for, for your idea. So overall, it's 15 seconds. Uh, 15 seconds, it's three times five seconds. Um, and that's why the actually interview intro part of your interview is important. So you have just 15 seconds of your intro until most of people already made decisions. And hopefully you will meet with experienced interviewers who will challenge themselves during the interview, will give you more chances, more hints. But still, it's a very important part and sometimes we forget it. The way we start, the way we shake hands or the way we say hello is already this 15 seconds started to count. So it's very important to be positive, to think about this just human aspect, right? And many companies, they even explicitly say that they have this be your test. Basically, they want an interviewer to write down their impressions about you. Because in many cases, they will spend actually more time with you than with their significant others. So it's important to spend time with people with whom they enjoy, drinking beer or hanging out or just talking, chatting. So. It's important to showcase that you are positive, that you want to do good things, you're a team player, you uh, basically even smiling helps a lot with this part, uh, this aspect of interview. And also it's very important to respect other person. When you ask something like think twice before you even start thinking about the answer, think twice what you were you asked, what was explicitly the question about. Um, because uh, unfortunately often like, I do a lot of interviews when I ask questions and people go in completely different direction, like talking about something. And I also, as an interviewer, feel it's not very comfortable for me to interrupt other person, right? But we are wasting this time when I need to make decisions about a particular aspect of the interview round and people are just like talking about random stuff. So please make sure you do a really good job in understanding your, the question. That's the key. You can't give a good answer until you get a question and then take your time. You don't need to jump into answer. Take your time to make sure you first understand. It's totally fine to ask again, like, oh, sorry, did I understand this well? And then think about your answer. Don't jump immediately. Sometimes, as my friend told, uh, before you, think, you say what you think, think what you will say. So it's important to think like ahead before you will do any kind of answer and concise as i mentioned it's very important to be concise we all have limits on time uh, this person who will interview you probably will have his or her responsibilities in like 40 minutes so it's very important that you provide uh, opportunity opportunity for this person to cover all the areas he or she needed to come so a concise answer is always good and if you are not sure if you're not sure it's always uh, cool to ask like do you want more details uh, do you want me to cover more aspects or specific things of this part? And body language is also important. Like first, as I mentioned, like you should have positive body language, person that with whom people will enjoy spending time. But it's also important to observe other person's body language. Um, for example, even feeling like how concise was your answer? Was it too concise or was it like too uh, broad? It's also by observing other other person. Like if this person, does this person like algorithm or not? It's all will probably could be read in many um, body languages for many people. So it's important to observe your own and your interview body languages. And then another specific part of interview, which not companies have, for example, on Google, I didn't have this part, but some companies take it the opposite side of spectrum very, very seriously. For example, Airbnb, I actually failed my interview because of this part. We have two rounds of vision and values 
And uh, I was uh, pretty, I think I was like one and a half years in America. I didn't know much about this aspect and I completely failed this part. So when they ask you, for example, what was the craziest thing you did in your life? It doesn't mean they wanted to hear the craziest thing you did. They want to hear like, what are your values? What are your visions? Like what you think is really fun, but also provide some value for people. Um, and it's important to first learn about the company's vision and values. For example, I didn't spend time watching Airbnb CEO um, Brian Chelsky videos before coming to interview, and it's complete. Uh, it's very big mistake. Like you should, you should be interested in the company, especially this successful company. Um, check out some CEO videos that will be a lot about this company vision, about their values. Um, and then it's also a question to you, like, do you have the same vision and values? Uh, is it interesting for you? It's important to have kind of homework before you come and meet any person from the company. And yes, yeah, I mentioned, think about your core values. You could be easily asked uh, such kind of questions, like what you value the most, like uh, what your biggest success and what your plan for next like five, 10 years, whom you want to become. Um, and the question that is common now I mean, among most of Silicon Valley companies, why you want to join this particular company? Like what's special about us for you? They know that money doesn't retain people, right? So never answer salary. And also I don't recommend to actually join the company because of salary. It's very low motivation. We never get enough money. We will be always upset if you just focus on money. We should focus on something much bigger than just money. For example, you like the vision of the company. You like the cohort of engineers. You like the area, something like this. But you enjoy the product. You use it from your childhood. But it's important to think uh, what are your motives about being excited for this particular company? And also, what's your career expectations? Like, um, companies want that you have clear vision of your career expectations so they can check if this job description, if this actually their plans for the job matches what you expect, because no one wants to hire you and then make you disappointed in like one year there, right? And achievements, as I mentioned, like it's important to think about self promotion, right? Um, think what you achieved in the past and also the question like what was your pro project you were proud about that was pretty normal question Silicon Valley but it's also important to recognize what were especially your skills what were strengths that helped you to achieve what was special about you like why you why not other candidates so it's uh, totally cool to think about this but uh, think this with reflection with self-reflection because you should also know your weaknesses. And that's a very common question as well. Like, what are your weaknesses? And what will um, your peers say about you if I ask them, for example? Right? Or, for example, what was your biggest failure as this in your position? So that's important to be self-absorbed and open-minded and demonstrate this. Because people who don't believe they have weaknesses probably are stuck. They will not grow anymore. And companies always want to hire people who will grow, who will, who are eager to learn and eager to know actually new things and uh, fight with their weaknesses. And you can't be, win your weaknesses if you don't recognize them. Okay, first part is technical. Let's talk about a little bit of a technical part, um, which is um, very specific for a particular part of interview uh, and job, uh, but there are a lot of commonalities between them. And I would say it's important to think about your own question. So when you ask the question, uh, you don't need to give answer, especially on technical part. Usually it's like 45 plus minutes. They want you to actually solve the problem in the optimal enough way. So it's important to make sure that you know all the requirements, that you understand the problem. You thought about edge cases before you even start thinking about algorithm. You should fully understand what was this actually problem about, what are limitations, what they want you explicitly to solve. And only then you come with algorithm. And often the first algorithm that comes into the head is not the best one. So it's also important, as I mentioned, observe the body language, ask explicit questions of your interviewer. Does this person like your algorithm? Does uh, he or she want you to actually explore more and all these kind of things? And yeah, look at this person, um, observe this person, how satisfied, because sometimes even me being a very experienced interviewer, it's not uh, very easy to say people that they are not right to interrupt people. Uh, so um, make this person comfortable, like make demonstrate you are open for like feedback for some hints to improve your solution. And then uh, think about optimization, like how you can optimize this. Even if interviewer likes, you can say like, okay, here's potential ideas that we can optimize this in future. 
And as I mentioned, focus on like verbal communication, like we are all humans and um, we ca communicate a lot of things, not, due, not just by words. So it's much more than this. Um, and only then you start coding or I don't know, it depends on your part of interview, but you go to the exact uh, piece, the most important piece of technical part only when you actually solved all the other uncertainties. And you don't need to say you're done until you test it. That's also very important. So come up with some ideas, some edge cases, try to test your solution. And only this, then, then you can say like, yeah, I think it's good enough. Because they also kind of try to see how successful you will be in the job if they give you offer, right? And that all describes like how you will approach the things. Will you think about requirements? Will you try to optimize the algorithm? Will you uh, do good part of like testing the things you develop. So it's very important to make sure that you have very kind of um, serious approach to development and to solve like technical part. And then architectural part also in, um, for many jobs, they want you to, especially if you already have industry experience to think about uh, high level, like what are components or systems you want to introduce, how they will collaborate with each other. So they provide you whiteboard now is these days is virtual whiteboard where you have ability to draw different rectangles, put their component names, think about their APIs, how they collaborate. If you are not doing like software development, it could be, for example, about your vision for future, like what parts, uh, what new uh, divisions you will introduce in your um, organization, something like this. This is kind of very high level part of your interview. And first, it's also important to think about what is the exact problem. Like think also like restrictions, requirements, understand it well before you actually jump even thinking about the uh, solution. And then it's important to, when you come, come up with ideas, it's important to also like challenge yourself, openly say, for example, there are things that you can improve, there are optimizations that, that could be done, think about bottlenecks, and you can explicitly tell to your interviewer like, here are the limitations of the system. Here are the bottlenecks. Do you want me to solve this or you want me to actually continue with such solution for now? And then start uh, thinking about components level and then maybe data flows and all these kind of things. And always think, uh, I think this is like very good slogan, like best is the enemy of good. So don't try to make each component of your system of your solution the best. It's usually impossible, right? If, if you're... Um, um, task is pretty uh, complex, there is no best solution. Uh, it's only good enough for each particular piece. So try to make sure each piece is good enough for your interviewer. Okay, let's go to the first part with real examples of the jobs I knew about, I observed around like, and I will just say what I know about these things. So uh, first of all, manual QA. This is basically the job where you have the system, for example, browser or application, and you need to find some problems, how they call it, bugs, right? Uh, you check that something doesn't work according to specification, or there is some button absence that doesn't work, these kind of things. And overall, uh, main responsibilities are related to checking the quality of the uh, system. And um, sometimes it also means that you need to write test suites, you need to execute another people's test suites, but make sure that this release, for example, is good enough to be shipped. Um, but it's also called, some people call it this door into IT world. Uh, this is um, the job that's relatively, um, that is relatively fast, relatively short amount of time needed to actually uh, get a job as manual QA. For example, some companies say like uh, they just need like 15 weeks and within, after 15 weeks of education, you could be completely, you, you, you don't need to know anything about IT world. You could be completely different, uh, in a completely different job area. But these companies say like 15 weeks is usually enough. If you're really focused, if you are smart, if you want to do good things and you're dedicated to this, after 15 weeks, you will land into like 70 to 100K annual job, which is really good. And it, it could be also in very good company as well. Um, and it's not just the end part of your career, it's just the door, as I mentioned. You can grow into software development in test, how they call it, or automation uh, QA engineer, where you will write the real kind of um, scripts or real um, system that will help to test it in automation way, not by people, but by um, the internal tools. 
another opportunity you can grow into software engineer um, for example how companies called SVE um, and it's, it's usually easier once you're already entered in this world it's much easier to already explore things uh, know people around they will give you hints books courses to read apply and then um, another opportunity is to go into EM uh, most of engineering managers or EMs uh, come up from a software engineer these days in Silicon Valley uh, it's not it's kind of the opposite of um, kind of uh, east coast where uh, most of managers come from MBA and such kind of degrees here is mostly software engineers uh, but I know quite a few examples that people go through QA directly into EM um, when people just EM just needs this kind of understanding of the systems how they work where a potential bottlenecks so there are a lot of commonalities with QA and then TPM is another role we will cover by the way all of them later uh, is the like technical program manager which is a little bit uh, could be a little bit easier to learn from QA because it requires you does require you to have like uh, to spend most, m m m a lot of time on like people and also doesn't really require you to know the depth of the technical solution it's more about driving the projects and then like PM is another another place which actually maps well from QA if you already saw the systems you tested them you started to think about competitors you got some vision what people like what don't like what is your users uh, what are your users what they want so PM is a person who has long-term kind of strategic vision so it's another uh, area to consider after QA and then okay. interesting that's that shows like real life. Yeah, for some reason slide didn't didn't switch. Uh, yeah, let me talk about EM career. Like uh, this is where I'm now, uh, and that's where I am the most excited during like last few years. Uh, as I mentioned, like I actually switched from Netflix just to uh, approach this career. And responsibilities are very easy to describe. It's in Silicon Valley at least. It's usually like just two things: make team happy and deliver on projects. And as easy as to describe this, it's as hard to implement because usually if you if your team is very happy um, they actually do execute well on projects but if team is focused on execution of projects it's hard to make them happy and balancing these two sides is really complex and they say like it's not the science is art right and overall like uh, working with uh, people with um, psychological aspects is not easy for sure uh, but that helps me to actually grow myself and my own personality so i'm really excited about this and also like in Silicon Valley, companies focused that people shouldn't be managed, they should be led. So um, usually there is no, no responsibilities in EM, for example, in Facebook, I can't say to my engineers, like do this, do this, I should inspire them and make sure they empowered and they're excited about this particular job. So it's a lot about like bottom up culture when actually engineers uh, do execute and managers and leadership is just there to support them. Uh, so it's important to build trust with uh, your reports and also inspire people that's a very important piece of em career uh, and also important to demonstrate care about the people sometimes it means it's not necessary just saying good words care is also providing constructive feedback uh, and make sure that people grow and uh, you help them to grow um, and also they're expected to have team vision and depending on the level of leadership they expect longer vision like from starting from technical lead slash manager uh, to different uh, levels until like VP should have like five to 10 years of uh, uh, kind of um, strategic vision into the product or area. And there's a very good uh, book from Kim Scott actually, and she tells us explicitly about balancing these two things, how to uh, be radically candid or radically direct to people and how, how to also demonstrate care. And she tells like, it's almost impossible to balance this great, like people do care or people do um radical directness one of these aspects they do well um so this uh, book has some ideas how to help balance and i think this is amazing book for um, managers okay then uh, another uh, careers and i feel they go side by side is like pm and designer career uh so pm as i mentioned like it's like product manager the person who has vision how to uh, make this product more popular how to grow this product how to make people like this product so it's a lot about like vision and strategy and designers usually uh, they help to execute pm they they all about tactics 
uh, that's why I mentioned, for example, Snapchat, Evan is like visionary and then he has um, meetings with designers every week to discuss what will be exactly the way to um, accomplish this kind of vision. Uh, so PMs usually think about market, like the whole market, what are the problems in the market, what are opportunities there, and designers focus more on the exact users, like what is solution for this user, for this um, user experience to make it like perfect, polished, this kind of things. Um, and PM thinks a lot about competition, like how we can win competition, how we can um, get the best from other competitors, where designers often work with real actual examples and also compare how to actually uh, solve this problem in the best way for this particular screen or app. Uh, and also PM and designers, they both actually think about these two aspects and also how to balance how we actually do growth and how we actually do respect user privacy. And this, um, these years, I think it's the very hot topic in the whole world about privacy, but we should also understand that there is like no way to grow if a company is solely focused on privacy, right? Um, even like Facebook, if you think how Facebook was growing back in these days, it was like things like newsfeed or something. Um, this thing that originally people didn't like, they didn't want that other people know, but it helps people to actually know about each other, know about new friends, like friend suggestions, for example. And eventually uh, they actually got new friends and all this stuff. So balancing growth and privacy, this is for what both PMs and designers actually care a lot about, and it's very hard to balance. Okay, and then last topic I wanted to cover is TPM career. It's pretty unique actually position. Many companies don't have this, but usually companies that have very lighter focus on actually um, delivering on time, for example, uh, companies that do hardware stuff, uh, they do have the TPM kind of positions, which call like technical product manager. It's almost EM, but there is no people aspect there. And also they don't uh, require you to have deep understanding of the system like design docs. It's more about driving the project or driving the whole direction. So it's a lot about organizational stuff like creating spreadsheets, making sure that all the dependencies covered among different teams, you have clear timelines and you actually ping approach people who, uh, or teams who didn't deliver why you try to solve, you escalate to managers to make sure that um, there is a way to solve some, some team that's sleeping or something like this. Uh, as I mentioned, yeah, less people work. It's less technical than, than EM. So it's a little bit, uh, could be easier bar to enter uh, if you are not very technical person, if you don't have engineering background, and if you're also not very interested in like uh, dealing with people issues, uh, this could be very interesting career to consider. So, and daily life, as I mentioned, is about driving projects uh, making sure everything is accomplished on time, all dependencies taken into account, these kind of things. Um, and career, career could be like very different. Like from TPM, you can grow as TPM, you can start leading TPMs, you can become a director of TPM, or you can transition into EM or PM eventually. So there's also a lot of opportunities in terms of career. Okay, and as a summary, I wanted to ask um, my last question for today. Uh, what is interview? Like, can you describe a few words? What do you think is interview? So uh, everyone, please type your answer in the uh, chat. Um, what do you think? What is interview? Uh, as Igor asks. And uh, everyone, uh, you may also raise your hand and ask you other questions in Q&A section um, while we're waiting for your answers. Uh, uh, also, there is a uh, yeah, Igor already answered. E EM is the engineering manager for those who don't know. And uh, can you also tell what is TPM? Technical, uh, technical project manager or technical product manager. It's, okay. it's sometimes companies call it differently. Yeah, it's technical person who actually drives the pro project or product. Yeah. So uh, uh, before before you continue, guys, uh, we also do this live stream on Facebook and YouTube and those who are using that. And also we are on Clubhouse. You can ask questions everywhere. Make sure you share the stream and also like uh, this uh, session because it helps us to promote it without any budget. And uh, so more, uh, more people can benefit out of this talk. All right, we have a few answers. Um, I dar uh, that says I, it's uh, interviews a dialect to understand each other better. 
Jeanne is just saying, do you need uh, to pass system architecture interview for front? -end? I think we can cover questions later in Q&A se session. Yeah. I really like, like, like answer from IDAR. I think it's hard to say it better. It's really dialogue. It's very important to remember that interview is actually two way street. It's uh, dialogue. You're absolutely right. Uh, and thank you for actually coming with this great description. So uh, it's not, and that's what I told, like make your own homework. Think what is exciting uh, about this company, this position for you. It shouldn't be money. It will be very, uh, you will very fast disappoint, disappointed if you just only focus on money. Think what is interesting for you in this company. What challenges uh, this company could provide? For example, as I mentioned, I had uh, really like a lot of uh, negative uh, insights uh, from some websites like Glassdoor about Netflix. I I read them and I brought this to interview and I asked like, what do you think? Why people say, say like this? So I had very honest and direct discussion with actually different levels of uh, Netflix before I even joined the company. So it's important to uh, consider that you come there and you um, basically should make decision, not just like get offer, but make decision whether it's good place for your like next X years to come every day, except hopefully weekends and um, spend time with those people. So I would recommend thinking very seriously uh, about each company, like what's, uh, what's your interest, what's your career growth, what's your expectations, what is exciting for you? And then asking those questions like, uh, check uh, interview is a good example when you're exposed to real people it's not like watching a movie about the company it's real people who will probably work with you so uh, asking tough questions is always fine like for example if i i personally like to ask questions if i especially have a chance to talk with higher leadership like what uh, cultural issues you have what are the biggest problems in your company that you want to fix or working on so asking such clear questions is also helps like to understand what leadership this company cares about. Okay, probably I already spoke too much. Um, now we will transition to Q&A session. I also mentioned a few books that uh, we are shown uh, above. I personally really love Wikipedia. Honestly speaking, um, most of my preparation in terms of computer science came from Wikipedia. Least hash maps, I just was reading. And I think the depth of Wikipedia knowledge is even um, larger than needed for most of companies. And then there are a few websites that helped me to actually practice the coding like interview beat and lead code. Uh, interview beat is more focused on particular companies. It has limited set of tasks, but they're really good to solve. And lead code has like tons of tasks, uh, but sometimes they are too complex actually, I think uh, to solve. And there are two also like companies that I mentioned that can help you to land job if you're interested. Lastly, I'm very curious to help anyone um, if you are interested to know more, add me on LinkedIn and also people who are excited about leadership, growing as leaders, feel free to join Tech Leaders Club where we actually discuss some things about leadership people. Thank you everyone. So yeah, let's move to Q&A part. All right. Uh, thanks for a great talk. I think it was uh, very valuable in terms of uh, the number of steps and the qualifications and examples. Of, I mean, that's a very rich talk. Thanks for that. Um, uh, we have uh, questions. Before we jump into questions, uh, uh, I would like to remind everyone again about our live streams. Please like and share. It helps us uh, to uh, grow uh, the audience and help the audience without any budget. And so uh, keep this kind of talks free for you so you can meet and benef uh, benefit out of the expertise of the speaker. Um, so, uh, Mm, those who would like to ask questions, uh, you may raise your hand and ask the question verbally or type your question in Facebook, YouTube or Zoom, uh, or you can ask uh, or raise your hand in, uh, uh, in Clubhouse, we will give you a chance to speak. Um, uh, we have a uh, first question uh, from Maxim Filkov. Uh, very good question actually about uh, um, Mm, about H1B. So some audience uh, might be not from the United States. Uh, and um, mm, it's kind of a challenge uh, for those who has uh, opportunity to, mm, to get into a company, but uh, might get an obstacle uh, of like legal aspects, like uh, visa aspects. Uh, so uh, did you get your visa outside the United States? And how did you get your H1B visa? Yeah, as I mentioned, I, I couldn't get the offer from like uh, big companies. I actually 
tried Google, Microsoft, May, Amazon when I was abroad. And these companies usually get the top of the talent inside the countries they try to hire from. So like, for example, getting a job in Google was impossible in, in Russia for me. It was like completely different set of people who came to interview. It's much easier to land a job in Google here uh, also because there's a lot of competition. So uh, Maxim is right, like it's uh, not easy to get visa because mostly because of competition. And I think America has still cap about like 60,000 H-1B visas per year. Um, so I, I ended up um, just uh, landing the job in startup. It took me like two years actually to just uh, two years of uh, applying on using my LinkedIn, um, failing, I think I failed like hundreds of interviews on different uh, uh, sites, but it's all about like persistence and perseverance. Like if you continue doing the job, I'm sure you will land in, the, in some of American companies and not necessarily the best one from the very beginning you uh, move. And I actually know Maxim, uh, he is my friend. So it's also a good example. He came into a small company here and eventually, actually his company was acquired by Google, for example. So he just transitioned into Google very smoothly um, within like one and a half year being in America. So. It's, uh, I, I think it's just about like homework. I don't feel that, that like, of course, luck is needed as in most of aspects in our life. But if you really focus on preparation on an application, if uh, you continue like uh, to learn new things and to improve yourself, you will eventually land. And also another thing like is there's a green card lottery every year, which is free, which you apply on September and October. And here at least I meet so many people who won this lottery. Sounds like, uh, it's also a good chance to actually get green card. Excellent question. And uh, I would like to share also my experience. Um, um, I had uh, two H-1B visas uh, and one I, H-1 I got in the United States and one outside the United States. And um, so uh, getting H-1 in uh, the United States is way easier because you can have a physical like face-to-face -face interview where actually uh, the final this, the, the primary decision makers takes a decision. Um, and this is uh, super hard uh, to, to get the uh, H1B even in the United States. Uh, one um, of the life hacks I can give you, a, a recommendation, I wouldn't say it's life hacks even. Um, uh, you need to build your network first. Uh, you need to build a network of uh, uh, entrepreneurs around you uh, or people who are working in those companies. So you have to be physically in Silicon Valley or in that location where you would like to be uh, doing your career. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, idea to start uh, your career within the startup is uh, a way, uh, very smart uh, because uh, you actually get into the field of working and you, uh, you'll be working and bu building your like, career path. At the same time, you have your paperwork done. Uh, and uh, mm, so it would be your first step forward. And uh, once you have your resume on your resume that you worked in the United States, it would be easier for you to be hired by other companies. Uh, then the challenge might come of changing H1B uh, uh, because uh, once you uh, got it, you are kind of stuck with one employer and uh, re re reapply for a new one will take a process as well, it will cost some money. Uh, though it's possible. Uh, and uh, uh, the other thing, you, why, how you can get your uh, uh, you know, work authorization you, you might be a student. You might uh, study at a like school. Like I, I, I was doing my PhD in a business school. And so uh, there is a so-called uh, internship opportunity like uh, CPT, CPT or uh, OPT. And uh, this uh, is official process where you can get uh, a work authorization. And after this, you can get your H-1B uh, through your employer because well, once you had some practice, they already like you. It's way easier to negotiate with them. Uh, and uh, getting H1 outside the United States is a way more difficult. It's like hundred thousands of times more difficult. Um, uh, I would say uh, when I was uh, doing my interviews for like back then when I was uh, approaching some jobs before my entrepreneurship career, uh, I had like thousands of interviews and most of them were super successful like uh, like really uh, almost every company 
uh, wanted to, me to join their team, but once it was going to uh, paperwork, uh, uh, it was actually conversation was frozen or like declined or like, and that's all. They don't want to deal with that. And most of them just don't know uh, the process and they think it's uh, they need to take any responsibility, accountability. And in fact, uh, not really much. Uh, um, uh, so um, you need to find a way to speak with uh, decision makers face to face and usually target smaller companies first then you can get it. But uh, the, the easiest way you actually uh, get here as a, uh, get, get into the United States on different visa and then uh, meet face to face, uh, take a uh, meet the decision maker, he takes a decision and then you probably get your H1B. So face to face face is a must do um, with a final decision maker. And uh, you need to find a way to get to him uh, physically. Zoom won't work. Uh, I tried. <laughs> I mean, it's possible. Otherwise, you may just be hired by a local company, like a local Google, and just get transferred. I actually worked for an American company like uh, 10 years ago, and uh, I was transfer transferred uh, to a Swiss office, like headquarters of that company, um, uh, just as a, like, as a promotion. So it's, it's, a, it's a possibility. It's, a, it's, it's normal in global companies. Yeah, we have the I also, other. I, yeah. I also wanted to add a thing about H1B. Like, basically, H1B is almost the same as green card. I didn't recognize it originally. First of all, I changed my job two times during H1B. So H1B transfer is pretty easy. Second one, you can infinitely extend this H1B if the company applies for green card. And third one, I was actually skeptical about H1B. I was waiting for green card. Was not brave enough to like buy the house and. Um, some like Indians and Chinese colleagues told me like, you should treat this as green card. And I started to do this because for them, their wait time between H1B and green card, no, 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 people know, it's like 10 to 15 years. So for them, uh, green card is something very far away and they still like come here and they still happy. And I was able to actually got 15, or I can actually get a 30 years old, 30 years like mortgage for my house. There is no problem. So I would say H1B and green card is very similar in many aspects. It's a little bit uh, harder process of switching job, but overall it's straightforward and most of companies do this very easily. Thank you. There was a, there was a question about architecture interview that I actually asked, I will, I, I told I will answer later. We can probably go back yeah, to that one. Uh, we have another question um, uh, about uh, uh, first steps. Uh, so you mentioned you started uh, working in the startup first. So what would be your recommendations uh, getting into like uh, FANG companies, so large tech companies where people can get a really good salary, career uh, in Silicon Valley, for example, if you focus on Silicon Valley today. So, uh, I mean, those companies, uh, how would you apply to get notice? Because uh, when you apply to Google or Facebook, every position uh, gets like, thousands of resumes a day and uh, recruiters won't be able to uh, actually look at your resume personally. They use some probably systems to scan through your resumes. What would be your recommendations to get through that uh, digital wall? Uh, overall, I feel it's a lot about persistence as I already told many times. Uh, for example, Facebook, uh, even last half year, Facebook goal was to hire 20,000 people. And when you need to hire 20,000 people, um, it means that you hire almost like you check almost every resume. So I think from my understanding and from my experience interviewing people, I often interview people with very unremarkable uh, LinkedIn profiles, very unremarkable. It's just people have skills needed for us. We interview them and then it all depends on the person. Like I don't think there is like any kind of elite um, set of people that uh, kind of came into the circle and allowed it's very easy to go from uh, startup to netflix for example in my case or startup from google but there is no limitation i think the hardest part is to get first job in america uh, get uh, american authorization uh, visa that's hard but moving into fang there's not, nothing special especially in terms of preparation it's very easy to prepare for fan companies there are books, there are websites, there are companies that help you to prepare. It's very straightforward. It depends just on how dedicated you are. If you really spend X amount of hours for X amount of months, 
there is no one who will stop you. I don't believe there is uh, someone who will tell like, oh, you will fail because you never worked in funk before. It's nothing special. It's just a special in terms of like um, innovations, in terms, in terms of scale, in terms of salaries. But overall, I feel every, everyone can join funk company. It's more about like preparation. And if you don't believe in yourself, I said, no, like many people just shy to believe and apply there. I, I recommend using like professional professional company that I mentioned that they will help to fine tune your LinkedIn to uh, speak with like industry coaches and all these kind of things. Yeah, please. And they will apply by, on your behalf actually, even if you're shy to apply. Yeah, please share the, the links of those uh, organizations uh, in your presentations, or you can actually answer you know, questions on our global chats. Uh, yeah, mentioned in the last like uh, careerist.com, apathrise.com, there are quite a few companies in this area. Okay. Um, and the other question we have uh, is uh, on, on the live stream. Um, uh, there is a uh, common uh, understanding that 90% uh, of success to get to uh, a fan company, you need to get uh, someone to refer you. So uh, they are asking like, what would be your uh, referral strategy? How to get uh, referrals? Uh, uh, so uh, you get notice among the crowd. I personally not sure. I think this is more like myth than, tr than truth. For example, message is a good example. I had so many people who I knew that amazing. I referred like 40 amazing engineers and they were rejected on, in the very beginning phase. Uh, but some people who didn't have impressive profiles, like uh, recruiters found them and they, they got interviewed. So I feel it's uh, much more about uh, just doing the right uh, part of like improving your LinkedIn profile, your resume. I don't believe in referrals that much. And if someone really believes in referrals, reach me out on LinkedIn. I'm happy to re refer you to, for example, Facebook. Um, and there is like, I just write down as much information as I know about you. It's all transparent, but I don't think it's important piece of your uh, package. Like your package will mostly be impression from yourself, how good you pass interview, uh, and also it's important to recognize that, for example, your LinkedIn and your like resume is important mostly for first step to just land in the recruiter call. Your recruiter call is important to land in like phone call. Your phone call is important to go on site and the highest input into your ultimate like offer, no, no offer and the amount of compensation is, goes from your off site or on, on site. All the previous st steps, uh, like what university you graduated, what was your GPA, no one cares actually. And even like which companies you worked before, people don't care. It's much more important to have really good on-site interview than all the other things. Excellent. I mean, uh, it's actually very different perspective from what I heard. I heard the other things that you got to build your network from specific company. You got to hang out with them, you got you to build the trust and then they can refer you something like that. But I mean, uh, it's actually very good that you have such uh, experience and position because it's, uh, it, may, it may give some confidence to people with, uh, who are trying without the purpose or can't have a purpose. Great. Um, I think uh, we can uh, wrap it up. I think we had- oh, Sorry, but we still didn't answer the question from Jeanne, I think, who, who asked us during the discussion. Um, you yeah, need to, to pass system architecture interview for a front end developer position. That was the question. Sorry, Jana, that you, we made you wait, uh, just like um, wanted to do it in QA part. So, front end developer position, if you're talking about, like, for example, web, web development, um, it, it requires you to write in uh, some code to do like kind of UI for, for the end users, right? And it all depends on like what is level in your position. If you just like, research a little bit about HTML or some like frameworks, fresh grad, then probably people don't expect you to do system architecture uh, side of interview. If you are like industry expert, if you spend at least a couple years in actually building already this kind of front end solutions, then it is important to uh, have this phase, but it also could be optional. Like until certain level, uh, this will be not the most important piece of, uh, of your kind of on-site decision based on your on-site interview. So more senior you are, more important will be uh, this part of interview. And of course, if you apply companies like Netflix, for example, who only hire senior people, yeah, of course, you will, you will be asked system architecture. All right. 
So uh, before we finish, uh, before you say your final uh, words, uh, uh, wrapping it up, uh, I'll show a few slides uh, about our upcoming events. But in the meantime, please think of uh, what you would like to uh, leave the audience with. It might be words of wisdom, your recommendation, whatever final uh, uh, wisdom or things you want to share with the audience. And in the meantime, I'll show final uh, slides uh, for the audience. Uh, and pass the word to you after, right after. Um, so uh, our upcoming events, uh, we have a talk with 500 startups uh, in, on March 4th, uh, it's basically in a week or so. Uh, and uh, we will uh, be talking about D2C brand with sustainable scalability. So uh, Susanna Sialiu, uh, she uh, built a company Pluto, uh, which is uh, direct to consumer brand. This is not easy to build such companies. Many large organizations fail uh, building direct to consumer brands. They actually failed so badly that uh, they had to uh, uh, hire distributors to, uh, mm, to do this uh, sales for them. So how would you as a startup build direct to consumer brand successfully and scale? Uh, Susanna can uh, open uh, this, uh, uh, like give you answers to these uh, difficult questions and share her expertise. Most of the entrepreneurs uh, that we bring from 500 startups, not only just successful, they failed a lot. So they will share their uh, ups and downs and you can learn from that, you can ask questions. Uh, the other talk we will have uh, in a few weeks uh, with uh, um, uh, venture fund Fortros, uh, from uh, the, which is called from Reno to uh, um, um, Unicorn. They wrote a book, Viktor Arlovsky and Vladimir Karovkin uh, wrote a book about uh, how to become a unicorn. And uh, the talk will be in Russian and it will be sponsored by, uh, uh, by many organizations uh, as well as uh, Moscow School Management Skolkova and it's going to be very interesting. Just make sure to prepare questions in advance. Uh, very interesting speaker is coming also for the Russian speaking audience, uh, how to enter the US market and to get, uh, get ranked 507 uh, by uh, gross rate. And uh, so Roman Smolevsky, he has built a company in the United States that is growing really fast and successfully and uh, can, can share his uh, insights how he actually did it and how he overcame the challenges and failures he had. Um, you know, uh, all this kind of activity is super important, uh, not only for the sake of knowledge, but for the sake of building network. And uh, we have two networking events uh, monthly uh, for founders to meet up and uh, connect and build network and build this, uh, you know, ties between each other. So you guys can help out each other building businesses. And we have one event in Russian every third Friday of the month. Uh, we already had one uh, this week. Next, uh, next one will be next month. And every first Friday of the month, which is next week, uh, we have a global monthly founders meetup in English. And uh, uh, so make sure to join us and you can connect with other founders from around the world and start helping out each other. Uh, this is the link. Uh, or QR code to our calendar of events and the system can notify you about upcoming events um, uh, on Gmail. And uh, this is our Eventbrite page where we publish our events, including today's one. And so you can click follow and you'll be notified about our global initiatives and events that we do through Eventbrite. So you could be part of it. And uh, uh, final words uh, that I would like to say, uh, we are not charging our audience, we build this community for the sake of spreading the knowledge, spreading the values we truly believe in, that for the sake of building the network, we can help out uh, each other uh, su succeed in uh, business, in career, wherever. So helping us other is important, giving back is important. So. Uh, Based on this conversation, based on this important and valuable information that we've got, please share this video on your social media, like everywhere, comment. It helps us to help more audience uh, around the world uh, sharing this uh, um, kind of content. And uh, this, this would be already valuable. 
on this note, Igor, uh, what would be your final uh, uh, closing statement for the audience? And thank you very much for your uh, talk and uh, great slides. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for inviting me. So I would say it's important to be brave and think big. I think this is the key for every person to be satisfied with life. So I would recommend just start thinking um, really seriously, like where you want to be in like 10 plus years, right? Like what, what vision you have for, your, for yourself, like what you really want from this world. Don't limit yourself, think really big. And then once you have this view into where you want to be, there are a lot of things that will help you and the destiny will help you, the people will help you. Things like Go Global World Community, like you can approach a lot of companies, a lot of websites, people like me, you will find a way to achieve your goals, but it's important first to align what's important for you. And I know like sometimes people who go like even fund companies, they don't necessarily go to build career in fund. I know many entrepreneurs actually join fund companies because they want to know from the inside, what the culture, how to build such kind of company, right? So uh, before you actually apply, before you start being excited about the next company, think what you want to be, where you want to be, and then come up with like milestones for yourself, with steps, and uh, that's important. And if you are very determined and you have your vision, it's what companies actually also respect. So think big, it's very important. And uh, if you're not very sure in yourself, I recommend book like Think and Grow Rich, probably many people heard like Napoleon Hill. The whole book is just about this. It's just how to be brave in your thinking, how to think big and how to actually accomplish those things. I really recommend this book, it inspired me a lot. I think once you got this belief, you are 50% already there. Once you believe that you can accomplish uh, this area, then it's just more like execution, execution steps. It's not dream anymore. It's kind of your plan. So yeah, I invite everyone. And yeah, thank you again, Danny, also to creating this community where people uh, just for free uh, collaborate with each other, build these kind of communities around the world, help each other. And I hope my talk also helps someone. Yeah, feel free to ask me more questions on LinkedIn if you want. And have a great um, rest of the year. I hope this year will be much better than previous one. Thank you so much. And that was Igor Pachodov from Silicon Valley. And Igor, what, uh, I know you're building uh, your local community on Facebook. Uh, what is the name of it so people can find it? Yeah, also the last slide was like Tech Leadership Club. I just, uh, now I'm very excited about uh, leading people. And I think there is a lot of way for me to grow there. And I want to um, kind of actually collaborate and talk and kind of meet with people who are also excited about growing into leadership, grow, grow, growing as leaders in any way that we, we invite people like directors and managers and also people who just start their past there. So feel free to join. There are a few questions to answer. Um, we also sometimes discuss books there. Sometimes we talk about our like mistakes or our findings. Um, yeah, but it's just free community for people who are excited to learn more about leadership and dealing with people. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Guys, thank you for the questions. I think we achieved uh, our goals. Uh, we, uh, we can continue our conversation on our global chats on Go Global World, uh, uh, on Facebook, uh, Telegram, uh, LinkedIn, and wherever you uh, prefer. Uh, we had this live stream on Facebook, YouTube, uh, Clubhouse, and uh, other systems. Uh, thank you for participation. Like, share, and uh, it will help us uh, as well. Join our next events. And Igor, thank you very much. Have a great day and bye everyone. Thank you and good luck everyone.